So then uh, let's welcome Dr. Staudemeyer, uh, who will talk to us about a senior network security monitoring. And yeah, welcome. Yeah. Hi. Um, so let's start. Like this is a senior network security monitoring. And this talk, I will cover a little bit my ideas and experiences um, about extending uh, um, a singer based monitoring system to do some security monitoring. Um, not really as a replacement, but uh, as an idea, like if you actually do not get the money or funding to implement security, that it can ex at least do something if you have a monitoring system running. So, um, about me. I'm an author, researcher, and world traveler, sort of. I'm currently associated with the University of South Africa, so I'm located in Johannesburg. Um, I actually do research in intrusion detection and uh, artific artificial intelligence. I do some pet research, privacy-enhancing technologies. Um, I do the monitoring mainly currently as a private exercise because I just like it and I've worked a couple of years as a network administrator actually to fund other research <laughs> and um, yeah so what I'm basically doing is traffic mining applying data mining on, on network traffic so I'm research mice so um, from 2007 to 2012 I um, worked as a network administrator for a large uh, research institute in Berlin. Um, that was like a accidental position, sort of. Um, I worked at the University of South, South Pacific, which is in Fiji, just on the other side of the world, for two years. Then there was a military coup, and then I decided, okay, let's get some government job, which like they, they pay, and <laughs> I can do my research. So, and there I built a quite big... Um, um, network. They had an old ATM infrastructure in 2007, which I um, uh, changed into 10 gigabit Ethernet over over um, two, two, three years, and uh, that was quite a big project. And um, uh, basically, we went up the layers, like from doing new fiber optics, new copper active equipment, and um, then the last step would have been uh, security, obviously. So on that road, because I wanted to work as less as possible, I worked myself into network monitor, network and system monitoring, and I sort of decided to use Nagios and with a student. I actually built a, quite a big uh, network uh, and system monitoring infrastructure. And sort of the next step would have been actually to do the security monitoring, but at that time um, there was uh, the idea of um, the people that employed me that they do not, that they want, they, I had like 300, like, there's a 1 dot million, 1 dot 5 million euro network, and there's a reservation of 300,000 for security. But then it was 100,000, and then 50,000, and 30,000. And that was sort of like, I, can you just do it somehow that we cannot get sued? And then you're fine. <laughs> so, so that was the whole idea, like, OK, what can we do with that uh, monitoring system we have running? And then at some point, um, I was finished my PhD, and then I just stopped working for government. And then I wrote the Nagios Singer cookbook. Um, it's a German book. Um, uh, which, which um, was published by O'Reilly, which I actually just wrote down um, what I experienced, what like recipes I wrote in that time, and um, so. And I also have a nice story about this. Um, um, you, you see, I I, uh, I write Nagios in a different way because um, um, the idea was the, to have that security monitoring in that book. Um, but O'Reilly just gave me, uh, initially gave me 300 pages, I wrote 900, and they cut it down to 600. <laughs> so that's the book out is now, and there's no security monitoring in there. Um, and there should have been an in, um, international edition, which then have been, would have been published with uh, no Stark Press there in California. And, um, but uh, Nagios Enterprises um, threatened O'Reilly and also no Stark Press to sue them if they would 
do an international version on that book, and there will be no second edition also for that reason, and there's not enough market to do a, a single book in, on, that, on that scale, so, and I refuse to do a Nagios book. So, m for myself, goodbye Nagios. <laughs> So, okay, this, uh, these are the stories. Um, uh, uh, this is how you can contact me. Uh, please use um, uh, keys if you um, talk to me, or use Twitter, because then everyone um, can follow it anyway. So, um, this talk is just to do something about your expectations. Um, this is not about securing your network. Um, so, you will never get your network secured. <laughs> And um, this is not about securing your monitoring system. You can improve things, but you cannot secure it. And these systems are built by people who do not really are focusing on security. <laughs> so, um, and I will not provide a turnkey solution. Now, this is like this is the start of thinking about um, a suite of plugins which would be helpful to do security monitoring. And I show you what's already available and what you can do from, like, basically um, what's there. Um, if you have a monitoring system, you want to know if you have a hardware problem or a service goes down. But actually, all the information you get out of your network, hey, the same information is used by next generation intrusion detection systems together with artificial learners to figure network attacks. Hey, and these learning algorithms, they try to rebuild human brain. That's why I'm doing this. And hey, you all have a brain, isn't it? So actually, if you process the data in a way that um, you can sort of baseline your own network over long, long periods, weeks, months, you will figure there are security problems even if you cannot map them. But if you have a way to see, okay, there is something anomalous and I cannot really, this is behind my expertise to map that correctly, but if you develop that skill, so you know, okay, now I need to call someone. On certain things you have that already, maybe on DOS attacks or scanning activities, but why not extending this to much more um, uh, interesting kind of attacks? So... Um, I provide ideas, you point out gaps. Like, keep in mind, I'm, for the last two years, I'm not r monitoring big infrastructures anymore. So I may be not in time now. Um, so I'm doing this as a side project. But I would be very happy to supervise a group and also to, to, to have a couple of students who work on security plugins. I need to know from you guys, actually, what you think would be useful. So if I, if I propose and I show what I've done, maybe it's from the perspective of an IDS guy or of someone who actually didn't run this for years. So if you have ideas, please get in contact with me. So the reality is that uh, cost saving on security is common practice. Um, so um, if you have the big luck to have some some boss who supports you actually building up that, that uh, monitoring infrastructure. So maybe monitoring on security, which is not really, you cannot really grasp it, you cannot really show there's a really performance in that system. Um, um, it's even more difficult to get money for that. And I thought things would change with the Snowden revelations, but actually they don't. That's my impression. So how do we deal with it? So, um, okay, this slide, I think, so it doesn't really map because all of you will have some sort of uh, monitoring system, otherwise you wouldn't be here. So, um, I will not explain about the advantages about Singer, Singer Nagmon, Schinken, and the other one. Um, <laughs> so, basically, they work, and I think currently that's, that's sort of the best on the, on the open market. Um, and security monitoring... Um, Okay, first, first policy to know, you cannot secure a place, you only can make things a little bit better. You can fix obvious and easy to fix problems. If there is that rule in security, um, you're only as good as the weakest link. And maybe you will not even figure the weakest link, but you can do a little bit 
to make it better. And on the long run, if there's a process to make a network more secure, or there's a process to secure your monitoring system, or a process actually to secure the connections between your monitoring systems and the systems you're monitoring, on the long run, or long run we will get better. So, see earlier things go wrong, also from the security perspective. And one really important thing, which um, like if, if we would go, if I would propose to that you learn to understand the, 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 the baseline, called the baseline of your network, you need a lot of graphing. You need to get away from actually um, uh, numbers. You need something visualized which you where you can detect differences over a long run so i definitely need graphing for this so um and the outcome uh, there are these monitoring plugins which are basically are the core of um uh, a singer or similar monitoring and i would like to have a second suit suit on security related plugins which could also be part of the monitoring plugins. Um, yeah. So, uh, roll your own Asinga monitoring, um, collect, collect performance data, run a central log server. It's like, um, I don't most of you may, may have uh, um, uh, seen the previous talk about Greylock. It's like, I was under the impression, okay, something like Splunk is not freely available. I thought that's really, that's the tool you need to connect like tools like this you need to connect to your monitoring system. Actually, if you figure out the an anomaly, that you can actually look into that time period and make a more detailed analysis on the log files. But it exists now. This is, that's pretty cool. I still worked with Syslog NG, then with a test version of, of, um, of Splunk, and basically then with Grab. <laughs> so um, then about... Um, Management traffic, I don't know how many of you actually have a separate management network where you try to make as much um, monitoring and probing over, over, the, over a separate network. So you do not have uh, unsecured traffic over your productive network. Is anyone doing like outband monitoring as, as far as possible? Not, not many of you. <laughs> Anyone who's doing this and thinks now it's, it was a bad idea? Okay. <laughs> so, um, basically, all checks that do not need to have a customer view or a client view on your service or on your target machine, I recommend to, to do the monitoring out of band. So, um, graph performance data, monitor security updates. How many, like... Okay, we have security updates of operating systems. Fine. How do is someone not not monitoring security updates on your switches and routers? Is everyone monitoring them? You have a primary and a secondary firmware. If there's a serious bug out there, do you monitor the mailing lists and then try to figure out, okay, do I run any of these firmwares on my, my, my machines? Something like having a probe actually check your devices and have a blacklist of firmware, is that an issue to do? No. I think there are even plugins out there you can extend in that way. Just checking firmwares, blacklist firmwares, and um, figure out which devices are vulnerable. So, um, the security of the monitoring server, when I started basically looking uh, into Nagios, that was in 2007, 8, first time I thought, oh, that's all, all it's, un it's all unsecured. The monitoring server is itself unsecured. The system is not built for security. Most of the checks are unsecured. So it's like, it looks really dangerous. That's at that point where I said, okay, we need to run this out of band, really, really important. So um, my first advice, use it on a dedicated machine. Who is not, like, Who's monitoring a reasonable sized network? Like, let's go beyond the thousand machines. And um, uh, um, uh, is not running uh, this on own hardware. Okay, that's good. <laughs> so um, then, um, is anyone 
running your monitoring system as root? Not, not anymore. Okay, that's good. Is anyone running plugins as root? So I think there are two reasons. Check DHCP needs to be in, then ICMP also needs root. Um, okay, I will look later into that. <laughs> so then you have a web interface, which you should secure via SSL. Um, who's, <laughs> who's having a web interface unsecured um, open in the wild? Is there anyone? <laughs> you shouldn't do that. It's like it's pretty easy actually to generate certificates, make it self-signed if you're the only guy, UCA cert, it's like a few steps and then redirect always to the SSL connection um, or access via VPN. So um, securing a web server via SSL, SSL who's, who thinks that's difficult? <laughs> who thinks that this is not difficult? <laughs> Yeah, it's not difficult. Uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I suggest always, always do SSL, always do redirect. I suggest to do CS cert. Um, um, and um, you can have assurance. I can give you assurance on CS cert if you're interested. So, um, creating a SSL certificate in a nutshell. So, I think I can skip this then. So these are just very few simple steps, and um, I don't really understand why not every um, uh, administrator running a web service actually doing something like this. Integration is also really, really easy. So um, yeah, look it up on the slides. It's really that, that, that's not an issue. But I think most of you have uh, have got it. Um, binary plugins. So um, <laughs> um, on 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 the um, great. Plugin exchanges, I will not use the names anymore now. Um, uh, there are a lot of binary plugins out there. And think about like you have, a, you have some sort of really important machine, you monitor about the services running there, and then you pick some plugin from, from a network and run that binary um, on a machine. So um, that's a really, really bad idea. Is anyone doing something like this? There are a lot of binary plugins out there. Do you actually compile the plugins yourself? I highly recommend this. So remote access, um, we have uh, NS Client, and I'm not talking about NS Client plus plus. Okay, I'm talking about the protocol NS Client, which is depreciated. Um, then we have NRPE, and we have the old SNMP v1 and 2c. Um, they are dangerous. I would not recommend using it. And then. Um, as I said, I recommend running plugins out of bands. Exceptions are avail availability checks. So re remote execution, I see two safe ways. Or anyway, that's what I did. I, one is we are SNMP v3, which is not difficult to set up. I heard it from many people, like monitoring guys. Oh, NSM, SNMP version three is like too tough to set up. It's not. And the other way is SSH, where you actually bond a key to a command. So, um, okay, um, I thought this, this might be interesting. Um, uh, do you know that it, you can, act, uh, who, who is using SNMP v3? Um, did you struggle to set that up? No. Now, basically, you remove the community, create a user, um, uh, set up um, uh, um, uh, like a, a user password and a, and, a, and a data stream password, which can be the same, and um, give the user read-only rights. And um, then you have a little bit longer um, uh, command to do, as, <laughs> um, to do version 3, but you actually you set this up one time. So um, this, is, this, is, this is no issue. And uh, where you can do remote execution with that, actually to extend um, your SNMP dconf with a command and map that uh, that um, the, uh, link that um, link that command, and then you can actually um, um, you can run that com command and fetch the output via SNMP, which is. Um, also, like it's 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 easy. You can create a wrapper if you need to process multiple multiple values um, to have like a own um, a own output. 
So my advice on SNMP is um, use SNMP version 3 on, on default. Um, don't use um, 2C um, or 1 anymore. If you're enforced to use whatever, if you, if you want to use like a monitor, an old UPS unit, which do not have um, 3 or a Windows machine where SNMP is depreciated, um, just uh, at least run this out of band and uh, bond um, the interface IP address. And um, use creative um, communities and uh, uh, limit um, limit access to the to the OID tree. This is um, also not really a problem. So remote execution plugins via SSH. So basically, you generate a key, uh, a key pair, and then you extend the public key um, with a command. So basically, if you make a connection to the remote machine, um, then um, just this command will be executed and you get the output in return. Um, I gave an example here, basically you generate the key, you edit your, um, your, your public key part, um, add the command to that with a couple of restrictions, um, then you move that command to the target machine, and now if you make a SSH session, like with a no terminal session, um, give that, um, um, uh, use your private key, execute the command which is in the public key, in the authorized key file on the, on the, on the, um, on the other side, and you get the output in return. So you can do this with every, with every um, local plugin. Um, now, uh, like the basic advice, always compare the fingerprint. It's like many, many people use SSH without actually knowing, I need to check the fingerprint at least the first time. And, and if there's a problem, I check it again. Many people just skip over that. Um, then, um, who thinks it takes too much resources to do SSH? Do you know what SSH multiplexing is? Okay, <laughs> who knows what SSH multiplexing is? You have a master connection. You set up a master connection which doesn't open the terminal session, which is actually doing the handshake and the connection, and all succeeding connections will get automatically routed through there. So basically, you save the handshake. It just gets much quicker. Mm. So obviously, you need to maintain that master connection and you can basically do this with a small script, um, which just makes make sure there's something called auto SSH, which just makes sure that the connection gets maintained and restarted in case um, um, there's a connection loss or there was a downtime. Um, I, doesn't, I do not say this works perfectly on large scale installations, but it works. So, um, NRPE, um, the standard. The standard install, which comes most distributions, NRP is broken, security is broken. I know there are a couple of fixes out there, but I don't think they really fix the problem. Um, so um, basically, if you want um, secure standard NRP, you need to um, encrypt that um, uh, separately. So basically, the advice here would, um, on, on Unix systems, to use SSH or SNMP version 3 always, and on Windows, use N um, NS, NS Client++, plus plus, um, which I heard now starts addressing some of the problems, and um, which I think is really, really great. And um, at the time I looked at it, pretty at the same time, um, Michael Medin made a blog entry, so and um, I, I, wa I was Beaker who made the only entry. <laughs> so, so I thought lots of people must be really, really keen on this, and there was not much activity. So I was <laughs> really impressed in a negative sense. So I linked the blog entry here again, and yeah, please do pull requests <laughs> on Michael Medin just just uh, that it keeps on working on this, that, that it gets simpler to be in. Um, to be installed. So um, now, NRPE configuration um, limit uh, the, the number of uh, the, the hosts which are allowed um, to contact the system. Um, you can do this uh, in NRPE configuration, and you can do this in the host allow file, where you can actually map to the daemon. 
and then um, disable command line processing. Um, there is a warning everywhere that you should, like in the, in the standard NRP um, documentation, in NSClient++, that you should not leave this on. Like most installations I saw, this is actually on. Nah? So this is really dangerous. There's something called alias commands. It's really, it's really, really nice. Please use that. I think many people just skip it, but it's something really nice. You bound one specific command. And this is much safer than actually um, send a lot of parameters, which can be modified by someone pretty easily. So um, my suggestion is to retire, <laughs> retire an NIPE. Um, but there's light. I learned this today and yesterday. And this client plus plus is addressing this problem. And the thing at two, what I thought is really really great, like the idea actually to have um, the core running. Um, on the on the client machine as well, and make just make sure there's a secure connection. I didn't really look into that now um, uh, because I learned about it yesterday. But I think it's it's really nice that it addresses a couple of problems of um, insecure access uh, methods. And I think that's awesome. Yeah. So local execution of root commands. So we had that um, that thing that there might be plugins that need root. And um, at least in the monitoring plugins, there is um, check ICMP and check DHCP, which actually only root, uh, run if they are root. So um, there are two options. One option is to set to do um, set UID, which has a couple of serious problems. Um, one thing, obviously, if there's this, um, uh, um, um, if if it's possible to compromise, it's possible to compromise the system by um, um, this this one binary which you are running as root. So um, the second issue is, uh, and you can actually run that binary with whatever parameters um, you want um, as an attacker. Um, but from the monitoring system, you might only use a limited number of parameters, so you do not need um, that um, the, the, that full function. And the other thing is autom automatic updates will always override the um, set user um, ID bit. So if the monitoring plugins get updated, I think they will not um, leave the set UID bit there unless you tweak the up update mechanism. And the worst thing, I think, activity is not locked. So you have no, actually, if this is misused, you don't have a log entry. So my suggestion is to use sudo. Um, and actually bound um, the, the, check, the, the checks um, like to sudo with fixed parameters. So um, basically, uh, on, a, on a Linux system, you can edit uh, the sudo file and create a command alias um, and uh, define, like you can uh, put the root, root plugins in with full path um, in one line. You uh, create a user um, with a root permission um, without a password, but that user can exactly um, run these, um, these two commands, like um, if you look here. And then you can even extend that, say, okay, um, um, I can extend check SCP with a whole of the parameters that should run on that, on that machine. And if sudo is run, um, with a check DC, uh, DHCP, then exactly that command is run and the output will be given back. Nothing more. So, and all sudo commands are locked um, uh, on the system. So you have log files of every try, which, which is good. So, um, the all-time favorites on, on monitoring plugins. Okay, they are the, they are the monitoring plugins. The monitoring plugins. Um, I think Manubolon is still really, really important, and it's really sad that there is no maintainer. Um, there is a um, DNS Michi. Michael Friedrich did a modified version on GitHub, which fixes um, some of the major issues. And um, I would really like call that someone picks up these plugins and keeps working on them. I, I think they are really, really nice. And I think there's no real replacement for them. And then obviously we have NS Client, and um, 
there, I think the lack, it's a bit unfortunate that, um, that NS client plus plus is um, um, not used more on, on, um, uh, on non Windows systems if there's opportunity to do that. So, also, um, <laughs> get, get, li get Linux, get Unix packages for NS client plus plus would be really nice. <laughs> so, what should you monitor? Um, so, building IDS systems, it's the basic values which are looked at at a system. So, basically, things like CPU load, um, things like transfer traffic, um, things like um, log, uh, log entries in the log file, um, RAM, storage, um, disk utilization, these things are actually looked at like where like intrusion detection systems look at these kind of values. These are the basic values you mostly do your monitoring with. So, and you can graph them. Okay, I understand that something like, like CPU load do not really, um, it might be very specific to a system. Depends how many cores you have. Um, so, if you take something like load, um, it's it might not be really comparable, but you can see if it increases or if, if it gets less. You can see it at a time scale. So something like um, the, the remaining days until service will not be available anymore is very nice for the network administrator, but not really nice um, for graphing, <laughs> obviously. So um, not every plugin makes sense in every setup. But I strongly suggest on any, every system, and I assume you're doing this already, um, to run these basic checks. Um, many administrators I persuaded to actually do something like, like, like Nagios and Isinger, they stayed for years until just uh, pinging just the systems, basically. Uh, which is a bit sad, there's a lot of more that can be done, but I think you guys are doing that already. So. So what else? Now it gets a bit more interesting. So um, I have a collection of nearly 50 different, um, um, different security-related checks which would be, interested, uh, would be interesting. So this is a selection of 10. And I, from these, I would like to have your, your feedback and your, your, your suggestions. So, um, okay, the most obvious is actually you can detect DOS attacks with the basic plugins easily, because you will have some sort of load, and as a, um, as a net admin or system admin, you know, okay, this is this kind of problem. So you already have that w w first step of detecting um, DOS attacks by, like different type of DOS attacks, by monitoring, um, uh, by using the, the basic monitoring plugins, and um, uh, uh, just, just do a basic monitoring of a system. So then we have brute force SSH guessing attacks. Um, so I, I had for a couple of years an SS gate, SSH gateway um, used by a couple of hundred um, um, researchers who uh, used that extensively and which had a continuous heavy load on external um, SSH access attempts. But this was not like, it was like too much to be processed, sort of. That was the way when I was looking into syslog and ng and into Splunk and actually figuring out, okay, I can sort some things in that direction. But the thing is, it's, it's easier to, um, it's much easier to, to, um, to map that. And I, I, I think it's like Greylock already um, gave you indica indication in the right direction. Um, graphing the number of entries of attempted logins um, gives you a nice, like um, a nice noise level on um, running SSH attacks. But now, if you run something like fail to ban, um, something that that locks the activity and blocks machines just to get the scripts stopping, um, um, you like the, the log activity will drop to new threshold. So now the interesting attacks will be distributed attacks and then you are actually be targeted. And they will show up again because fail to ban will fail on them. 
So really easy, just log activity works. Um, then um, network scanning activity, um, most people I talk to, to that it's like okay that happens all the time. If I have external open machine scanning, it's like it's like login attempts. It's like like um, um, it, it happens all the time. But the thing, if you have internal scanning activity, you have a problem. So it could be a student or someone just playing around. It can be Skype. <laughs> So it can be some tool, but in most networks it makes actually sense to um, use something simple like ports entry to um, look at internal scanning activities and if on secure networks are activities like this, create alarm immediately. Because there it shouldn't happen. If it happens on your server network, you know there are issues. <laughs> So, um, web server compromise. So, um, who's, who's monitoring the number of processes of your web server? Okay. <laughs> the thing is, um, normally there are specified number which is like very specific for a system. So, you have a system where there are between Three and seven processes is standard. If you get more processes, you might have, um, you might get zombies of people um, start fiddling around with the servers. So um, you get a number of processes which is above the threshold. You might, you might have a security problem. Um, if you get below the threshold, you might have a, a service delivery problem. Um, then you have redirect hacks happen pretty often. Um, just monitor the um, HD access file. This is, it seems to be a pretty common method um, to attack a web server, and it's pretty easy um, to see um, configuration file modifications. And obviously, there's something about web website defacement. You can do a smart string search. That's easy. Um, so SSL certificate checks. Who's actually monitoring the certificates? Okay. <laughs> okay, so then I can kind of skip that. Um, monitoring validity and expiry and uh, run a check um, if the certificate is actually the one um, you placed there. So DNS health. Um, there are some extensions for DNS, which is resolution poisoning and um, to check if, the, if your own um, DNS server is authoritative. Um, that's easy, that's part of check DNS. Um, anyone not doing this, running a DNS server? Okay. <laughs> so, then um, monitoring network service changes. Um, actually, I think this is some, something pretty important. The, own th the only thing which went a little bit in that direction a few years ago was actually using Nmap and then write your own scripts to figure out um, if you have new machines or new services that shouldn't be there. Um, uh, last year, no, that was half a year ago, I stumbled over the assimilation project, which might be something in that direction. Do you know the assimilation project? Um, so uh, that tool basically is doing passive scanning, looking at, uh, at the network traffic passing and just um, creating lists or creating infrastructure um, graphs what uh, machines and what services are part of that network. It's really nice. And um, today I learned about NDU, uh, network device. What was network device? There was a talk about this today. <laughs> um, so um, network discovery, I think it's really, really important. It would be really nice to get that integrated. Um, but I do not see the perfect tool yet. Also, things are like appearing in that direction. Then email security. I think the most important thing is to figure out if you are spamming. So obviously, I think most of the people of you will uh, graph them, um, the, the, the mail queue size, I guess so. Um, who's, like, who's checking for open relay? OK. So who is monitoring blacklists? Okay. <laughs> yeah, these are also my re recommendations. So D um, DHCP health, I'm checking for rack, uh, rough and rack 
uh, for malicious DHCP servers, um, check the ECP. Um, might be not super relevant anymore if you have proper uh, network infrastructure equipment who can bend that easily. But um, um, it's still a common problem. So then switch and router security. Um, many devices actually create internal alarms on certain layer two attacks. And um, like if interfaces go in pr pr promiscuous mode or if there's R spoofing activity or there are frequent MAC address changes. So, um, and some of these alarms can only be read out basically using SNMP or with the proper tools offered by the um, switch um, vendor or, or, or router vendor, which is a proprietary software. Um, my recommendation is actually to, um, to use SNMP to read these LAM states um, out of the switches. You need to get, a, get the MIP of the devices and look them up. Um, but this is something really, really nice to connect um, to, a, to a monitoring system. And that's basically just to find the right SNMP values, which give you the LAM states. So, um, and then... Obviously, you can basically push um, all, um, all logs to a central log server and look from there. No, that's the other approach, and I think most of you guys will do that already. So, and then the white and black listing of running firmwares. I think this is, this is uh, really important. And check for the primary and secondary firmwares as well, because some systems, obviously, you have an active firmware and reboot into a second firmware in case you get a problem um, with a new firmware. So, high-impact vulnerabilities. So, we had Heartbleed and Shellshock, which are basically can be checked with a script on a, on a target machine. So, um, it took, didn't took long time until there were actually Nagios checks available for that. Um, did you... Did, did <laughs> um, you all will have systems being affected of this. Did you actually use your, your, your Nagios or Singer or Nagmon installation to figure out the machines which are affected? So that's, that's easy. Um, there's the, the other thing is the, the Drupal hack. I, I, I looked up if there's, someone wrote a check for that or not. Drupal 7 had a like, worst case uh, vulnerability with, a, I think it goes with a, with a SQL injection where it can get root writes on one shot. Um, and at least the Drupal developer says there are millions of machines affected. Um, hey, with a, with a check, you can figure this out in no time. So I think if there, there should be more movement in that direction actually to look for vulnerabilities, is there an easy check to be done um, and then just made available for the community to, to run that check? Uh, on larger infrastructures and not looking up specific machines or oh, which Debian versions are we running there, there is, is that affected? Did the security update get, went through? So my conclusions are monitoring systems are not built to be secure, but at least you can improve security a little bit at actually looking um, um, you look into SSL, look into how, how do you access, um, uh, how, how do we execute the remote plugins? Um, that's that's pretty easy. Um, monitoring systems are actually perfect to monitor security, but I don't think there's enough thought spent into that, and I would like to see more happening there. And it would be really nice to have a security monitoring plugin suit. And um, so these are my suggestions, and I would really hope to get some feedback from you. Um, I have the advantage that I can actually ask students to work on on these kind of things. So uh, I just need to make a cool project out of that, and I think these are cool projects. So visualize your data and watch it over a long time, get big screens on the wall, and just look frequently what's happening on these systems. Graph it. I don't know, who is having big screens on the wall and graphing network activity? Okay, no, not, not bad. <laughs> 
and log your data sentry. But um, my impression anyway in this conference is that logging is a big thing already. So um, um, that would be another talk and there are better, better, um, there have been great talks here already. So um, please provide feedback. Please send me plugins if you have things in your desk, you think that that's not coded really nice, but I would like to have a look at it, would be really nice. Get into contact with me, encrypt. <laughs> um, use the suggested ha hashtags if you contact me via Twitter. Um, all plugins I work on um, or I work together on with students will be open source. Yeah. Um, last thing, if you would like to do some key signing, I'm happy to do that. Um, I'm a CSA cert assurer. If you want to get into CA cert, I can assure you and have some forms with me. So, in case you're interested. That's it. Okay, not too bad. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Okay, not too good. Ah, yeah. Uh, uh, just a suggestion, I think, uh, why no one is doing uh, the vulnerability scanning for shell shock, heart bleed, and etc. cetera uh, via Nagios or Singer is uh, I work at a university and we have in no means everything in our monitoring because it's impossible to get everything on the monitoring. There are so many people doing things. Uh, we scan our net actively when th these uh, things happen and there is no point in doing it into the monitoring. So we scan our whole network, every IP address, uh, looking for heart bleed, looking for shell shock and uh, that's it. And you, you continue to do that and Basically, yeah. you you do take down everyone who who runs such an insecure thing. Yeah, yeah. I really I, I get the point. Like arguing, okay, there's another tool who's doing that much better. So why should I do the monitoring? The thing is, intrusion detection systems, next generation, they use data that comes from monitoring systems. So and this is the, uh, the road I would like to go. So there are many cases where. Maybe I propose ideas which really are not really applicable. So that might be, but I just would like to push the discussion in that direction. But I really get your point. Uh, did you attend the talk about uh, Isinga 2 yesterday? And what's your opinion about uh, uh, Agent Core uh, SSL uh, third key thing or yeah. this new technology? Okay, I learned about this first time yesterday. Yeah? So um, I, I, I think I, I mentioned this that I that I heard about it yesterday, and I think it's it's like a really great thing if you know. Okay, there are remote execution methods. I will not be able to secure the the, the monitoring guys. Will use that, and I need to make sort of sure it's secure. So the idea of a single two in that regard is pretty pretty good. I think so. Um, but also, sure, it depends um, how good their coding was. <laughs> So, but it's open source, so you can pay someone to look at the code. <laughs> I think I think it's nice. I think it's really nice that people think into like to see that as a problem and try to implement fixes. So, and um, I think it's it's a sort of a nice fix. Okay. Ah, um, uh, I have a couple of copies um, of the of the cookbook, um, which are with a singer guys at the entry. So it normally costs 50 euro, um, it goes for 35. Um, <laughs> so if someone's still into, there are not, not many copies left, so um, feel free. Okay, thank you for listening. <laughs>